Good morning. My name is Graham Shaw. I'm an internist and integrative physician here in Los Altos, California. <clears throat> I work at a clinic, and the name is Integrative Medical Associates, and I also am a consultant for Get Well Natural. It's an herbal company that provides wellness information and also herbal dietary supplements. What I wanted to talk to you today about is cell membranes. I've been researching cell membranes for the last 10 to 15 years, and I'd like to offer some science and also some ideas about how cell membranes can affect our health. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is going to be deadly boring, but I'd like to assure you that cell membranes are fascinating and also provide an avenue of associating these with our other health issues. So let's start with cell membranes. What exactly are cell membranes? So cell membranes are the outer layer of the cell, and they are made of two layers of fat molecules, so they're called bilipids. And they have a very important function. Embedded in these cell membranes are protein structures, which offer an avenue of transporting nutrients in and out of the cells. And these protein structures are called channels and also pumps. Additionally to that, there are receptors on the cell membrane that interact with neurotransmitters. So if you wanted to know what the cell membrane looked like, you might uh, use the example of an olive bread. So it's bread with a circular olives in it, and the olives represents these protein structures that transport nutrients in and out of the cells. So what exactly does a cell membrane do? do? And so the first thing that it does is it controls the fluid and electrolyte balance of the cells. And it also is very important for getting nutrients like vitamins and minerals and nutrients into the cells and also getting toxins out of the cell. So the cell membrane has many other features and f functions and one of those is it also controls electrical activity and it also controls the propagation of nerves. So it's very important in the nervous system and it's very important in the cardiac system. The other important thing that the cell membrane does is it controls communication. So it controls communication with other cells and it also controls communications with the brain. And it does that through various neurotransmitters. As you may remember, there's receptors on the cell membrane and these re receptors pick up neurotransmitters which can be transmitted from brains, et cetera. So the next very important thing that the cell membrane does is it controls energy. And the cell membrane is very resourceful. It can control um, and it can employ various times, types of energy. And being resourceful, it can use energy from sugar, from proteins, from fats. It can use electrical energy. It can use electronic energy. And it also probably can use solar energy. So, the next thing I wanted to talk about is some of the energy states. And the most important one, and the one that functions in most normal cells, is this one here. And you'll have to excuse my artwork. These are supposed to represent channels and receptors. So the first energy state, which is the preferred one for cells for energy, is called oxidative phosphorylation. And that basically means the cell is using fats, especially essential fatty acids, to produce energy. It's the most efficient way of producing energy, and it's the preferred way for the cells to use. So everything works fine as long as there are no stresses to the cells, but if there is a stress to the cell, and that could be a nutritional problem, it could be a hormonal imbalance, it could be a chronic infection, it could be a chronic toxin like mold toxicity, biochemical toxicity, um, it could be heavy metals. And it also could be excitatory factors, which are things like alcohol and cocaine and um, various things like that. Nicotine is the other one I was thinking of. So if the cell is under those stresses, it has to fall back to a secondary reserve energy. And that's what happens with oxidative phosphorylation. It changes into a sugar-based metabolism, and that's what's called glycolysis. Now, there's good news and bad news about glycolysis. One, it does provide an emergency 
source of energy, but the bad thing is it is very inefficient. So glycolysis provides about 5% of the efficiency that oxidative phosphorylation does, and that's the bad news about it. So in addition to using sugar, it also employs the sodium potassium pump, which increases electrical activity. And electrical activity causes a hyperexcitability of the cell membrane. And we're going to come back and talk about that in just a second. When the cell is under extreme stress, the cell membrane converts over to a third choice as far as energy, and that's protein. And this is called gluconeogenesis. Uh, it is seen in extreme cases uh, like terminal cancer and also terminal infections like AIDS or tuberculosis. So basically what's happened here, the cell membrane is breaking down proteins which are mainly in muscles and this is what causes muscle wasting. So let's go back and talk about glycolysis. Glycolysis again is the use of oh, sugar and the sodium potassium pump to increase emergency energy. But the bad news is that in using this is very inefficient and it depletes energy. And the energy we're particularly talking about is called ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. So the problem about having low energy is that it means that you have to get energy from the electrical system. So the sodium potassium pump and the sodium potassium pump is a real drain on energy. So you get this vicious cycle where uh, low energy causes increased cellular membrane excitability, which depletes more of the energy, which causes more excitability. So let's talk about what are the symptoms of glycolysis and this problem with low energy and excitability. So the first symptom, and one I see very commonly, is pain. <clears throat> And this pain could be generalized pain, or it could be pain in the muscles. It also could be pain in the bones, and commonly it's headaches, so pain in the brain. <clears throat> so the other major symptom you get is you get a depletion of uh, the principal energy source, and that causes fatigue. So the early symptoms of a cell that's under stress that's going through glycolysis <clears throat> is that you get fatigue and also pain. And uh, of all the patients I see, that's probably the commonest symptoms that they bring in. So the other additional symptoms, when you have hyperexcitability, it increases the oxidative stress, so you get more oxidative problems. <clears throat> you also get lactic acidosis. And then you get a cascade of problems including uh, inflammation, um, cell degeneration and cell damage, th things like fibrosis, uh, scarring, ulcerations, and ultimately you can end up with the death of the cells. So too much hyperexcitability starts that cascade and it eventually can turn into death of a cell. The other alternative is the cells can become more independent, and we call that dedifferentiation. And dedifferentiation means that the cell loses its identity of what it started as, and it turns into more of an independent cell, which eventually could lead to cancer. So we have a whole cascade of influences that are basically starting from the hyperexcitability and also the fatigue. So let's talk now about what we can do to help this situation. So the first thing and the most important thing is you have to improve diet. And of the dietary things, the most stimulatory are sugar and sodium salt and also iron. And iron as in red meat iron. And I think you've probably heard from other doctors that those are foods that are not good for you. And the reason they're not good for you is because they're stimulating an already stimulated cell and increasing this cascade of health issues. So the next thing you need to do is reverse whatever started this process, and that could be detoxification, treating the infection that you have, rebalancing hormones, uh, stopping any excitatory uh, factors that you're using, cigarettes, drinking, etc. There are various agents that will counteract the hyperexcitability. 
and those agents are both natural and pharmaceutical. So some of the natural ones are things like magnesium and potassium and omega-3 oils or essential fatty acids. Potassium is a calming agent. Uh, you remember I said that sodium salts were bad for excitability. Well, potassium salts are good for it. Uh, vitamin D is a cell membrane calming agent, as is melatonin. And I would like to predict that over the next few years, you'll probably see these uh, names of these natural agents in the news as agents that help chronic illnesses because they're helping cell membrane hyperactivity, and that's being a contributing factor for a lot of problems. Uh, asthma, heart disease, osteoporosis, maybe even cancer. Uh, there are various herbs that help with cell membrane hyperactivity. Uh, one is kava kava, which is very famous. The one that I like the most is a herb called sophora, and sophora is spelled S-O-P-H-O-R-A. Uh, it's in a blend that Get Well Natural Herbal Company makes, and it's called Cell Saver. It's a fabulous product, and it's one that I take regularly. The pharmaceutical agents uh, are very helpful in calming down membrane hyperactivity, and those are things like seizure medicines, uh, antiarrhythmics, uh, statin drugs help. Um, uh, all the antidepressants are cell membrane calming agents. That's why they sometimes help with chronic pain and chronic issues. The problem about pharmaceuticals is they really don't fix the underlying issue, which could be nutritional, it could be toxicity, it could be infections. So in my experience, uh, when we treat hyperexcitability and we use the natural agents and we help the diet, some people get better symptomatically, but they don't completely recover. So it's made me wonder if there's other issues going on. And the two other elements that I think are going on with our health is number one, emotions. So how on earth do emotions affect cell membranes? So let's go back. We talked about the cell membrane having neurotransmitter receptors. And the two I'd like to focus on are number one, glutamate. And glutamate is the most important neurotransmitter that's excitatory. And the second neurotransmitter is called GABA. It's G-A-B-A. It stands for gamma amino butyric acid. So GABA is the most important relaxing neurotransmitter. So it's my feeling that uh, the emotions of fear and anxiety probably increase glutamate, whereas the more positive emotions stimulate GABA, which is relaxing, which should help the disease process. So if you have chronic anger or chronic fear, it's going to exacerbate or increase the amount of hyperexcitability that you have. The th second thing that I think is going on with cell membranes that's contributing to our health is thoughts. I know this is a little bit of a stretch, but the cell membrane is extremely sensitive to energy, and it's extremely sensitive to light. So a cell membrane can detect one photon of energy, which is one of the tiniest uh, measures of light energy. So it makes sense to me that if it can detect or be affected by that little energy, that it can probably be detected, detect thoughts and be influenced by thoughts. And so what thoughts am I, th uh, am I thinking of? I'm thinking about subconscious or unconscious thoughts. Uh, those thoughts are probably more likely to be repressed or suppressed thoughts. And those energies, those thoughts, are interfering or affecting the cell membrane, which is affecting our health. So just as a summary, let's just talk about what we've covered so far. Number one, cell membranes are very important for a lot of functions. Uh, they control nutrition, they control balance, they control the immune system, they control um, uh, energy, they control uh, transmission of neurologic of nerves and also of electricity. From my point of view, they're really the brain of the cell membrane, and what they do is they control the day-to-day -day affairs of the cell. Whereas the nucleus might be controlling memory, the cell membrane is really the computer uh, of the cell. And it's very interesting to note that at least one scientist has looked at the cell membrane and compared its structure to a micro or a computer chip. 
So in conventional medicine, we like to think of all disease as starting with biochemical problems, and it starts from the center of the cell and moves out. Uh, I would like to counter an alternative theory, which is that most diseases are actually bioelectrical, and they're more likely to be centripetal. In other words, they start with a cell membrane and their influences go into the cell. So in conclusion, I'd like to just uh, make my vote for the cell membrane being a unifying concept of health. In other words, nutrition, physical factors, emotional factors, and also mental factors may all be impacting the cell membrane, which is also impacting our health. It's a very exciting thought for me, and it provides uh, the opportunity and the options for patients to explore their, their illnesses a little more deeply. And with that, I'd like to conclude by thanking you for your attention, and also I wish you all the best of health.